Well, every day is an experiment now, right? <laughs> Especially right now. <laughs> yeah. Give, give so. me a big old clap. <laughs> nice. All right, let's do it again then. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, better. <laughs> Uh, All right, we're fresh. rolling. I've been recording the whole thing. Perfect. And then I guess and, I'll start building the wheel. All right. So cheater, cheater line will give you the will give you the inside line. <laughs> uh, think about favorite tools, favorite bikes, favorite races, favorite riders. Think about all that stuff. Oh that boy. We'll to eventually. But before we start, before any introduction, you were Aaron Gwynn's mechanic when he got tenth. At his first World Cup downhill in Mount St. Anne, right? Correct. And his first podium, which was MSA or Bromont the year after. I can't remember which one. All right. Take us take us through the weekend of the 10th place. What was that like? Just <sighs> run, run us through that story. Get a little street cred here, and then we'll do the intro and keep going. So we just booked it from would have been one of the, I think it was a snowmass race uh, in Colorado. So show up for the World Cup team in MSA. Basically, I had to pin it across the country, so I was already sleep deprived um, because that drive was not not a hundred percent legal to do in the time that you always had. Okay. <laughs> so right, no, wait, before, before you go on, it's what do you mean? Like you booked it? Like Aaron had done? Well, Aaron, well I forget what leave. Aaron had done at Snowmass, but I think it had been. Justin, Leov, and Blinky were on the team at the same time. And so they had, uh, they had, um, he just put in a heater with them. And I think he might have beaten them at Snowmass. It would have been an MSC or a national race, a pretty basic race. Um, okay. But he had just, he put on a heater. And I remember Justin and Blinky both saying, dude, that's a top 10 World Cup run you just put in. Like, you know, and at the time, those guys were top 10 World Cup riders. And so he got the nod to go from the national team to Mont St. Anne. And that decision had been made a few weeks beforehand um, because all those guys loved Aaron and, you know, were stoked on how fast he was and everything like that. So um, Aaron hopped in the truck with me, I think. Yeah, he would have driven over with me. And we just, you know... Race ends Sunday, you pack up the whole rig as fast as you can, and you start hauling, um, just because it's a long drive. I mean, yep. you know, Colorado to East Coast with a border. Wait, no, that was the year. Sorry, I'm going to completely screw the story. That was the year that national <laughs> champ. That was the year national champs was right before Mount Snell, when okay. which was his first national champs. He'd had a he'd had a heater on a snowmass probably the week before. We were at. Mount Snow, he was pretty much considered a guaranteed win. Um, everybody, everybody in the pits was pretty much like, "What are we racing for? Like, we're racing for second. Aaron's got this. Yeah, Aaron's got this. Like, we're all racing for second. It's what's the point?" Um, and that was not the best weekend because in his race run, he's like he smoked a little two to three inch uh, stump and ripped his tire off the rim, rear wheel. Um, mm. You know, just racing happens kind of thing and just smoked it. And he's like, and he's like, I know exactly what happened. I went two to three inches further or six inches further than I have been all week long. Kaboom, race run over. So kind of crappy, but you know, he knew he was on speed. So then we, cross the border, go up to Mont St. Anne and start gearing up. And, you know, he's on par, just, you know, putting in laps, pretty mellow stress, right? Like, hey, it's your first World Cup. Like, just go ride your bike and let's see where it goes. Keep on yep. pace with these guys and have fun. Um, and besides, besides Leo and Blinky, did, did other riders know who he was yet? Um. I don't think so, because he wasn't really, I mean, and Grubby, because Grubby was on the team, but he was so focused yeah, yeah. on four cross, he wasn't racing downhill. Um, you know, I th I'm sure the word was around, because, um, you know, the Fox guys were all about him. Fox is going to be using him for testing after Mont St. Anne. Um, 
you know, so I'm sure there was a little bit of talk of, hey, here's this up and comer. Um, but you know, you show up at a World Cup race and there's a whole different realm of stress going on. And so we're kind of like, well, let's see what he does. And one thing I will say about Gwen is from day one, that kid, well, he's not a kid anymore at the time he was to me. Um, he was professional, right? He, he didn't act like a rookie on the circuit. So he was always looking for how could he improve? How could he be stronger? How could he do whatever? analyzing his lines like from day one so that's part of where the confidence came from um so he starts cranking out laps um just doing what he does and you know you can kind of hear a little bit of a buzz in the pits because everybody's like dude this guy's definitely he's there he could be there like let's see where he goes and so you know I think I was wrenching on his bike and Justin's bike. Gregor Molchik, who was kind of the um, one of the mechanics in Europe, was wrenching on Blinky's bike. Um, so you know, I just had the two bikes to handle and building wheels um, because it's Mont Saint Anne. It's pretty much all you do in your time off. Um, uh, I'm gonna get to that later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so he just kept hammering and just kept putting in laps and analyzing and talking with everybody and it was you know there was a little bit of stress and a little bit of okay you know how's this going but he just took it like any other race weekend there was no pressure right show up see how it goes he's gonna race in the national jersey um i think because that's the only way to get you know he didn't have any points or anything like that and then we're and then he qualifies, and I think he qualified. He qualified thirteenth. I don't. I'd have to. You'd have to check the stats on that, but somewhere okay. he qualified well, you know. And so <laughs> I remember being up there, and I'm sitting at the start line with him, where two riders out maybe from him dropping, and he's like, "I think I'm gonna bar hump the finish line jump." And I'm like, what What the hell are you talking about? This is your first World Cup. Like, are you insane? He's like, Kill, it's a great jump. Like, it's just begging for a bar hump. I'm like, oh my God, this is what I've got to deal with. Like, and to be honest, it's, it's my first like real World Cup wrenching too. Like I'd been to Angel oh, Fire. I didn't know that. Yeah, I'd been to Angel Fire years before um, when I was with the Cannondale crew, but and you know but i had our kind of national grassroots that were they were rad ricers but you know this was a different level of dealing with all of this and so i'm like oh my god my racer is deciding that he's gonna go bar hump the final jump I'm like awesome <laughs> this is this is amazing like the guy's actually qualified well we're on pace i'm like okay here's the deal bar hump it if you're feeling good and if it's clean and whatever but you know just be, be safer than sorry, you know, be better safe than sorry and whatever. And he's like, yeah, okay, fine. And then, you know, I later find out he threw a bar hump. And the funny thing is about that is everybody's like, oh my God, he threw a bar hump. That's amazing. Just loving it. And I'm talking to him later. And he's like, that was one of the sorriest bar humps of my life. Like he was bummed <laughs> on the level of the bar hump he did in, you know, his first World Cup race. And so I send him off. He goes down. Um, I can't remember if Blinky or Justin qualified higher, so I must I might have been up there a little bit longer, um, because we and we didn't have race radios at the time. Like I didn't have a radio down below to know how anything had gone, and so I'm coming. i everybody's off. I'm loading up all the junk, hop on the lift, come down, and. I'm getting off the lift and it was either Bewley, Melissa Buell, or Nevin Steinmetz, I can't remember which one, came up to me as I'm getting off the lift and goes, holy crap, he got 10th. And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, <laughs> who, what? And they're like, Gwen, he got 10th. I'm like, no, you're kidding me. And they're like, no, seriously, like, I didn't believe him. You know, I mean, yeah. we know the guy has speed, but I was like, what? And I run over to the finish line and confirm, like, you got 10th. He's like, yeah. I'm like, oh my God. 
That's awesome. So, you know. Did he not see it faced? Like, he wasn't surprised? He was stoked. He was surprised. But yeah, that was the thing with Gwen from day one, right? From Fontana. He knew he could. Like, that's one thing I always... And he always had that... Always does have that quiet confidence that, yep, I'm that good. It was never an ego. Like, I'm better than you guys, blah, blah, blah. It was just, no, I belong there. Like, and so, I mean, he was ecstatic and he was stoked. Um, but yeah, he was kind of the, one of the funniest things I love about that story too is those, I saw some of the squids get, you know, media squids posted some photos and posted some stuff of Gwen the other week. And I remember seeing his helmet from that race. And I know it wasn't after because he had one pair of goggles and one lens that he ran all season to that point. Are you serious? Yep. It had been one lens he had been nursing for the year. <laughs> and after that, uh, Damien Smith, the team manager, called a buddy at uh, Smith and said, um, so we need to get this guy some goggles. And they overnighted like goggles and glasses and all that to Bromont. And since then he's been on Smith. So yeah, awesome. one lens. I mean, we know how one lens lasts in one, you know, one race and it was, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Awesome. And then, you know, he went and he did some testing with Fox the next day and, you know, and then it was, it was MS Monsignor and the next year they got the podium because I came off the lift and again, whoever it was, Buley or Nevin, same person, he got a podium. I'm like, okay, this is deja vu. You've got to be lying to me. And yeah, yeah. Nope, he got the podium the next year there. Dude, yeah, that's yeah. so cool. So, oh, man. yeah, that was, a, that was a hell of a weekend. I was pretty happy with that one. Yeah, I guess, understatement. <laughs> so... <laughs> All right. Well, let's do this for real. Get it official. <laughs> That's a dope story. Like, we could be done like that. Let's, let's go. <laughs> no, but. Welcome, mountain bikers. I'm your host, Sean Spomer, and this is Vital MTB's The Inside Line Podcast. And today we have Patrick Zeust, who I know now is not Zwest. That, I'm so embarrassed about that. <laughs> but he's a man wearing many hats over at FSA. And as you've just heard, he has plenty of interesting history within our game. Thanks for being on today. Pretty stoked. Yeah, me too. Sweet. So uh, what are we going to try and do today during this inside line? I heard some clinks and clanks in the background. Uh, well, I'm building a wheel uh, for AT, for one of our team riders. Um, so I've actually, just in that story time, I've almost got it laced. <laughs> so it, nice. the the wheel will be done probably before we're done with the stories, but yeah. <laughs> Sweet. So if you're listening on the podcast channel only, we're hoping that this works out technically. This is a little a little new for all of us, but we're going to be posting the video of Patrick building the wheel as he's interviewed. So if that gets done, you can see it on the site on our YouTube channel, all that good stuff. But yeah, dude, thanks for being here. And yeah. I wonder if it's going to be like one of those like EXP, NDM, FNFG kind of sound. <laughs> you know, one of those. <laughs> yeah, we'll see how it goes. We will, yeah. How many how many wheels do you think you've built in your life? Uh, hundreds, easy. Probably, anyway, I haven't counted a lot recently, but I've also been building a lot recently, and so I didn't want to count them. I'm probably upwards of 500, I guess. All said and done, maybe. Um, I mean, for our team wheels this year, I've already built, I think, um, 25 or 30. Okay. Just for our guys. Then, you know, I build wheels for myself just because, you know, when you get decent at building wheels, it's kind of fun to have different wheels with different tires or whatever just to goof around on. Um, <laughs> And then kind of a close group of friends I build for. Um, okay. You know, anyone who contacts me, I'll probably build them. But, I mean, I usually try and keep it pretty small because it's on the side kind of thing. And so then... You have an inbox full now. Yeah. Well, you know, there's worse things. Um, and then, I mean, as we kind of mentioned, you know, working... When I was with Yeti, we were on DT Swiss. 
back in the day of the old white EX 1750s, um, mm -hmm. which were a phenomenal race wheel. Uh, they were their trail wheels, so the rim was a little soft, <laughs> um, which meant you had to build a lot, but they saved race runs, so it made perfect sense why we were on them. I mean, mm -hmm. I saw my guys did it a couple times. I saw PD at the end of Bromont one year where they dented the rim so far past the beat of the tire, you could reach up and grab the tube. Are but they didn't flat. Yeah, like, yeah. Tire was still on, tube was still inflated. Um, you know, they finished the race run and then that wheel went in the garbage. Um, but yeah, so you built a lot of wheels. <laughs> yeah, all right, sounds like it. What, uh, give us a breakdown of what you're building right now. Um, right now I've got an Onyx Classic Hub, uh, our new gradient carbon rim we've been doing the gradient wheels for a bit but um a bunch of us kind of pushed to get rim only um so we're finally got those in for actually just got them in i think this week for sale which is kind of cool um Sweet. some straight gauge spokes and brass nipples just because it's at and we you know he's not exactly gonna be easy on it either so that's fine okay um so going straight instead of like double yeah um all of my wheels i build double on you know most trail wheels i build double kind of all the you know that's more definitely more of a standard for me um mm -hmm. but for the downhill guys i and uh those where i'm not around to maintain them i build uh straight gauge with brass nipples um got it just because and like uh you know when you got guys like last year i had volkov on a set of these wheels same rim gradient 28 hole um, on some onyx just and we just do the onyx for the guys who need downhill hubs that we don't do a hub spec for um, mm -hmm. And I built him a set at the beginning middle of the year and he went to See he started him at loose fest, which he was a little nervous about running a 28 hole carbon wheel at um, <laughs> For some odd reason um, I had confidence in it. He was like, oh, I'll give it a try I could have a spare set of alloys just in case um <laughs> But he rode all of Loose Fest, a week at Chattel, a week at Retallic, where there's a video GoPro line of the year that he pretty much missed the trail and just rallied through some rocks. Um, whole Crankworks, and then um, Dark Fest, and then later in the season he told me he was still actually riding the wheels, and he hadn't touched them. Like, when I say still riding the wheels, I mean, he literally didn't, touch, didn't have to retention tension or anything, so. I was pretty stoked with that wheel build. Heck yeah. It like <laughs> it. Um, well, I've been having fun on the wheel set that you built me. <laughs> Good. Which has the gradients with the onyx and yeah, plus the red nips. I like, that accent. Is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's part of the fun for me. Like when I build wheels, and this is why I like to do it for friends. Like I like to know what they're riding, how they're riding, and try and tune the wheel for them. Because, I mean, custom wheels, that's half the fun, right? Is like, hey, let's have a little color in it. Let's do a little, you know, do you need a double butted or can you get away with a straight gauge or whatever? So. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Well, like you said, you're probably going to be done before we even get it. <laughs> well, I'm already starting so. to tension it, so. <laughs> um, we'll get into your history and all that stuff. Has the, uh, the whole corona thing impacted you very much? Um, I'm working from home, so in that sense, not, I mean, I normally work in the office, so it's just work from home now. Um, it's, you know, we're still staying busy. Like, I'm in charge of customer service, too, for us, and, um, we're still busy. Like, people are still riding bikes, for sure. So, it's, yeah, it's impacted me, but it's not, like, oh, God, kind of thing. Okay, cool. All right, let's get into your history. Where'd you come from? How'd you get into bikes? Get all that good stuff that... Oh, boy. Uh, That's how we kick it off. So, grew up in the hotel industry, which is kind of an oddity, but just meant I moved around a lot. Um, had, had some interesting, you know, experiences with that. Um, and then... Like, would you live in a hotel? Yeah. Um, no way. Hotel Bel Air for three and a half years. So I had an 11 and a half what? acre playground that I ran around with on a BMX bike and a skateboard. 
No way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of it was an interesting, you know, setup, but yeah, my parents have some funny stories of me falling asleep in high-end restaurants and you know, whatever. It was just like, to me, it was normal. I'm like, whatever, I'm tired. I'm going to go to sleep. It's, I'm nine years yeah. old and out with a bunch of adults. Like, it's nap time. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it was, so with all the moving around and all that, we ended up, for high school, we ended up in Bend, Oregon. And I mean, I'd always okay. ridden bikes. I had a BMX bike. I just, as I said, rode around the hotel or neighborhoods or whatever. And in Bend, basically, long story short, found mountain biking and loved it. Um, okay. Also snowboarding. Wait. I rock climbed more in that high school than I did road bikes, but it was part okay. of it. And what year was this? Like what time? 93 to 97. Okay. And then went to college up in... I've got you beat by a year. <laughs> by a year. Woohoo! <laughs> um, went to college up in Walla Walla, Washington. Um, Whitman College and there I kind of you know that's when I really started to get into biking and you know you could get all the information like you could get information a lot quicker internet was pretty prevalent so I was finding out about racing and you know I bought a copy of Crank 2 which I just about wore out I think when I stopped counting how many times I'd watched it I was over 50 um, <laughs> yeah kind of knew that movie a little too well um <laughs> But I was, you know, I was on a GT Avalanche LE hardtail with a gold Judy. And, you know, it was this legit XC bike. It was great. Um, yeah. But I liked to go down things more and jump off staircases and wanted to get more downhilly. So, but I was a college student, so I wasn't exactly rolling in cash. So I went down to the local shop and I was like, here's the deal. I need to focus on work on college school for obvious reasons but i need parts because i want parts for cheaper and you know i'd learned about trading in the industry from my dad with the hotel business you know you trade rooms for so you get to go stay at a hotel for cheaper and so okay i was like here's the deal i'll come in i'll work for you for free for a couple hours a week whenever i can i'll stock tubes you can teach me how to work on a bike whatever um, I just want to be able to order parts that I want from at your cost for right now. Like you don't lose any money. I just pay you what you pay them. And eventually I want to order a bike the same way. And the guy's like, okay, sounds like, you know, I mean, he's getting free labor, just straight up <laughs> under the, under the table, free labor. And he's like, yeah, I can't argue with this. Um, so he starts teaching me and he was the big BMX shop in town um okay dealt with a lot of bmx race bikes and he was known for that and so he's like he started teaching me how to you know build a bike out of a box or whatever and i was like sweet and just started doing that and really liked it so when i went home for the summer because that was the end of my junior year when i went home for the summer i went to a local shop told them what i've been doing like hey can i have a summer job working here and they're like we'll try you out and worked out and liked it. Went back for my senior year where I wrote my senior sociology thesis on the subcultures of mountain biking. No um, 50, 50, uh, somewhere, I'm sure my parents have a copy of it or something. 57, 57 pages of it. I would convinced my advisors that I needed a week off of school to go to Sea Otter. So that was my first Sea Otter experience was that spring. Uh. Because my parents okay. lived in that? my parents lived in Napa, so it was easy. Uh, Two thousand one. Okay. And oh, Napa, nice. Yeah, so it was like you know we were close. And my dad worked in at the time worked in Seattle in San Francisco, so it was okay. an easy way to get down there. Yeah. Um, so that was research was just go hang out at Sea Otter for a week, <laughs> which was <laughs> rad. Don't get me wrong, for obvious reasons. Um, and. After college, went back to that shop and basically worked there for till the winter, through the winter. Uh, moved to Seattle to hang out with friends because I didn't have any friends down there because my parents had moved after I'd left for college. Um, mm -hmm. And 
Moved to Seattle, worked at Greg's Green Lake here for two and a half years. And the Sea Otter experience, pretty much, I wanted to be a race mechanic at that point. So, kind of... Were you, were you racing at all on your like? Were you doing racing at all? Or nope. Just going to check it out? Just going to check it out. Yeah, I didn't... Yeah. My first... I did one XC race when I was at Greg's, which that was a bad idea. Um, <laughs> and my next race that I raced in would have been 2013 at Northwest Cup. I raced one of the Northwest Cup races. Yeah, cool. So, like, I wasn't a racer. I just, I saw these, I was loving being a mechanic. And these yeah. guys were the best. You know, the race mechanic was the best mechanic and all these cool pits and da da da. And I'd been watching mountain bike racing since, you know, as I said, like 93. So mm -hmm. I wanted to be part of it. And yeah. in fall of 04, Canada, I, you know, I, cause I'd bug the reps, I'd let them know. And demo job opened up for, with Cannondale. Um, so I drove a demo truck for them for two, two years six or nine months on the east coast and the rest on the west coast and in that time you do like they had the bare naked uh candale bare naked grassroots team like their kind of national team and so when that race was happening in your area you were the mechanic for it so that was a good intro to it all um okay. but it was mainly run around do demos um which was that was a hard life that was three, I don't know, just like the volume of the work. 365 days a year on the road. I didn't pay rent for two years because I was in a hotel every night, different hotel. Yeah. Um, I think I figured out I drove 65,000 miles a year on top wow. of full demo schedule, race schedule, whatever in my area. Holy cow. Yeah. So, you know, you really didn't get a day off. And there's, you know, things have changed since then. Like the industry's changed. And, a, and that was. I wasn't driving a Sprinter. I was driving a four-door long bed dually with a 28-foot gooseneck behind us. Like, Jeez. I was the length of a semi-trailer, right? And so, yeah. it wasn't... You couldn't just go park in a random spot or whatever. Um, but yeah, so I did that for two years. Uh, that ended. Um, then I signed on with Shimano Multiservice for a year. I drove, for one season, I drove the mountain truck. So... Mm -hmm just their neutral support rig that went to all the big races and that was national so it wasn't even a territory i just drove all over the country for the summer okay uh after that went to yeti for 08 and 09 where you know gwen's first year was 2008 with them so kind of up through there and that, for that i was a north american mechanic so i drove i you know national mechanic for all the national races the world cups that were in town I was there for those for Bromont and Mont Saint Anne both years, um, and then that ended. Went back into shops for a little bit, um, and then in 2012 started FSA as a tech guy, and now I'm running tech warranty QC customer service and dabbling with mm. a little marketing and a little photography for him. Yeah, so dude, eight years over there. That's pretty sick. Yeah, it's been it's been a great run. Okay, so looks like the video that I did on Monday kind of died out what we were trying with Vital. So uh, Spomer asked me to kind of go through the finish of the wheel build and what I was doing. Um, basically, last shot you see is that I'm dishing the wheel, just checking to make sure hub is centered side to side in the wheel. Um, at that point, kind of went through and then continued with a, a tensiometer just to make sure that all the spoke tensions are even and as close to even as possible. Um, when I do build a wheel, especially for an athlete or a downhiller where durability is the number one concern, the wheel sometimes won't actually be dead 100% true. Uh, might be out of half a mil or a quarter mil or something like that, where the having a dead even spoke tension is actually more important than having the wheel be completely dead straight. Um, you know, for just a general wheel, always make sure that, you know, it's nice and straight and everything like that. But the number one thing is that it lasts. And with disc brakes nowadays and things like that, you can get away with, um, kind of that, uh, half a mil out if it means that you are overall going to build a stronger wheel. 
Uh, so yeah, finish the wheel up. I think in the podcast, Spomer says it was about 40 minutes from start to finish. Um, this is the final wheel um, with the gradient rim, some team issue decals, straight gauge, black spokes, DT Swiss uh, champions, some black brass nipples for uh, AT, um, and it was good to go. And so yeah, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it and hope you guys enjoy the, you know, quarantine beard that I got rocking here. Just, you know, might as well make it a little fuzzy for a little while. And yeah, hope you guys enjoyed the podcast and, you know, I'm sure once it's posted, if you want to ask some questions, I'm happy to answer them if need be. Thanks.